Hey sisters and brothers, welcome to another episode of WDRS Talk, the Wolf's Den radio show talk. This is your host, your brother from another mother. I haven't seen you in a while, folks. I love it. And uh, it's great to see you. This is Wolf Hemora. And uh, thank you very much for joining me for another episode, another great interview that's coming up. It's going to be episode 39. Uh, I had a couple of uh, months of uh, of a break <clears throat> but truthfully honestly um i didn't really have uh i didn't really know anybody i wanted to interview uh because this show is really you know i don't force the interviews you know i don't just interview anybody and it it has to be somebody that i am interested in or you know of that sort so a couple of months and i really couldn't uh find someone that you know i i wanted to uh, interview you know ask questions about but uh, it's great to be back and episode 39 is going to be a real doozy because it's going to be a great guest uh second time guest uh this is the uh, second guest that is doing a second episode with me and rightly so uh miss june millington of fanny the lead guitarist of fanny is back again with us to promote and to talk about uh, the, the new Fanny movie, The Right to Rock, which came out in the Philippines uh, a few days ago, and it's still running. Uh, it'll run for maybe a couple more days. So please do um, check out the schedule if, if, you have, uh, if you're connected with me on Facebook or on Instagram. Uh, just look for the the schedule of uh, I mean not schedule but the list of theaters around the Philippines and it's playing all over the Philippines. Um, it's playing in all the SM uh, movie theaters except for Iloilo. But uh, I think Iloilo and Bacola they're gonna come soon. Not just yet, but hang in there, folks. But yeah, it's all over the Philippines. And if you are a rock and roller, if you love rock music, you have to watch this movie. Fanny, The Right to Rock. Um, for those of you who don't know who Fanny is yet, Fanny happens to be the first all-female band, all-female rock band that was signed to a major label in the U.S. Um, in rock history. They are the first all-female band to be signed major label. And two of their members, their founding members, are from the Philippines. Miss June Millington and her sister, Miss Jean Millington, who is the bass player of Fanny, and she also sings uh, lead vocals as well. And um, so their movie just came out. Please watch it. Um, the movie list is on my Facebook page. Go check it out. You got to watch it because it's so inspiring. And you have to know this because the mere fact that the first all-female rock band ever, well, not ever, but signed to a major label in the U.S., half of its members and its founding members are Filipina. So let that sink in for a couple of seconds. You know, I mean, this is big news. I only found out about this maybe in the past three years, right before the pandemic started. Um, I bought their... Uh, record in a record store for five dollars it was an old record but the cover you know the the band members are on the front cover of the, th the it's the third record the third album called fanny hill and um i saw the the, the album cover and it's the the band you know the band members and june millington is right at the center and like that is a filipino woman no doubt about it who the hell is this band and you know the, the the album. You know, I checked the date on the album's release, and it was released in 1973. And you know, it was just I just found it, and I saw the cover. I saw June in the cover, and I go, "That's a Filipino woman for sure." And um, and I saw her sister too, Jean, and it's like that's a Filipino woman too. <laughs> you know, it's like who is this band? And um, so I bought it for five bucks. And I put it on, and it was amazing. My head exploded. I was like, 
who are these people who are these who are these women who are these badass women so i start doing my research on youtube as one would do and there are tons of videos of them live live footage of them on youtube and man if you haven't seen footage of this band yet you gotta you gotta because they are such a bad ass band regardless if they were women or men they were they were so badass they rocked just as hard as the bands that were were uh, you know were were active back in you know in the late 60s and early 70s and we all know if you know your rock music those years were the best years in my in my book in my opinion those years were the best years of of rock music and that's why now it's called it's presently called classic rock because it's up there with beethoven and mozart and 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 bach and and fanny even though they didn't get the recognition that they deserved they were in the thick of it they were part of it um they were contemporaries with all these um musicians that eventually became rock stars and important people in music you know David Bowie was was coming up alongside of them. He was such a big fan of Fanny. He was such a big supporter of Fanny, and I think he had a short relationship with uh, with uh, Gene Millington as well. So, um, and he wrote an article in Rolling Stone magazine, just giving praise all over uh, this band, and rightly so, because you know, for all of you who know them already, you know, you know. Man, these guys are, yeah, man. Anyway, so I'm fanboying right now. Um, so going back to the interview, we talk about the movie because I saw it when it came out here in in the states, uh, maybe a month ago. I think that was a month ago. The last time I interviewed June Millington, um, it was the the documentary. This movie was still in production, but she talked about it. So when it came out, and I, I actually saw it in the movie theater, and it was amazing because you know the mo- the sound system of a movie theater is amazing, you know. So you could hear their music full volume blasting on the theater in the in the in the speakers of the movie theater, and it was just amazing to see their story, how they came up from uh, from gosh, uh, I forget. It, it escapes me now where they're from in the Philippines, but they moved to Sacramento in the early 60s from the Philippines. Their father is an American, their mom is, is Filipina. And um, <laughs> cut a long story short, I'm, I'm just so proud of this band called Fanny. I'm, I'm very proud of the Millington sisters. Even though they don't have a, a Filipino last name, man, it's their soul. Their soul is Filipino as fuck. <laughs> And uh, they they acknowledge it. They are very proud to be Filipino, and the mere fact that they released the movie in the Philippines all over the place, man, is a testament that they did not forget where they came from. You understand that they did not forget where they came from. That is so important, and I think we should give them the recogni- recognition that they deserve. They should be given, uh, you know, awards. For, for accomplishing what they did. Because if you if you stop and think about all the musicians, all the music that was coming out in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, everything in America that was happening, uh, The Doors, uh, Hendrix, uh, Little Feet, Grateful Dead, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder, all of these people, man. And they were there. They were... They were there. They, they, man, I can't tell you enough. So you gotta watch the movie so you can, you can see what I'm talking about. So, um, yeah. So go and watch the movie. Anyway, um, in other news, before we get to the interview, I wanted to uh, give you a couple of announcements on my part of life and uh, regarding my band, the Melodies. Um, first off, our guitarist Nivera. Uh, has a new single out on his own. He's 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 got a solo uh, career, career music career happening as well. 
and uh, his new single Bones just came out. Uh, so go check it out on Spotify. And he has a new music music video as well on YouTube. So check it out, uh, Nivera. And the, the name of the song is Bones. Um, on the melodies, news about the melodies, we are about to sign with an independent label. And um, we, are, we have planned to release the first single, which is the, the, the new version, the legitimate version, the official version of Laman. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard it before, but if you have, it's going to be a much better uh, uh, a version. It's going to be the legit version, and it's going to be coming out as planned, uh, well, planned to come out in October 28th, just in time for Halloween. So you're going to have a, a nice soundtrack when you go out uh, trick-or-treating or the parties that come after trick-or-treating when you put the kids to bed <laughs> or whatever. Um, so yeah, so check that out, October 28th. And we are um, right now finishing, doing the finishing touches on the recording of the album, of the songs. We, to we have a total of 10 songs. And we're finishing up the recording process. And we're going to be uh, uh, passing it over to a good friend over in New Jersey who happened to be the engineer and the guy who mixed Wolfgang's second album called Semenelin. His name's Diego Garrido. And uh, born and raised in New Jersey, Jersey boy. Um, he went to the Philippines in the 90s for, for a spell. He worked as a sound engineer. And he was also a, uh, an active musician in the, the local music scene back then. Um, if you know that band from the 90s, Electric Kool-Aid, he was the guitarist. And he also played uh, uh, bass on the, the debut album of uh, the late, great June Lupito, Rest in Peace. Um, so yeah, he's a, he's, and he mixed the Semenolin album. Uh, so I, I know this guy from, from way back, and he's going to mix the, the Melodies album. Um, so we're excited about that. We really love what he did with Laman. Uh, he's got a really, really cool imagination uh, when, uh, with regards to music. So we wanted to continue working with him with the other songs. So do check it out. October 28th is Laman. And then maybe two months later, we're going to come out with another single. And then eventually the album is going to come out in uh, 2023. And it's going to be great because we're really working hard on it. And we're really proud of, proud of the songs uh, that we, we've, uh, you know, written together. So, so check it out, uh, Melodies. Uh, follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. Instagram is going to be The Melodies Official. And I think on Facebook it's uh, The Melodies, at The Melodies. So please, please, please follow us. Uh, promote our music to your friends, to your families, to your lovers to your kids, to everybody. All right. Thank you very much. So on with the episode, episode 39. Enjoy this one. This is a, a great conversation uh, with the lead guitarist of Fanny. Check out their movie in theaters right now. If it's uh, today is uh, September 11, uh, commemorating September 11, 2001 as well. So there, uh, when you hear this, and it's September 20, I, uh, the movie might not be there anymore. So sucks to be you. But if you hear this before uh, September 15 or something, go out, watch the movie, get inspired, be proud of Miss June Millington. Enjoy. All right. So... Bye. <laughs> Here we are with another episode and an exciting episode with uh, the one and only June Millington of Fanny, lead guitarist, lead singer, uh, co-lead singer. Is that what you you would describe it? Well, you, yeah, I, I sang some of the leads. We we all did, you know, contributed. Me and Gene and uh, Nikki were the main three main. Singers, and then we did a lot of backup, and sometimes our drummer Alice would join in. 
and it happens to be her birthday today. Oh, that's right? right. Oh, my God. Don't make me feel guilty. <laughs> that's right. I haven't well, written her yet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, yeah. I, I saw it on your Facebook, uh, your Facebook page. Uh, so as we record this for the audience, uh, it's September 4, and it's the birthday of uh, Alice the. How do you say it? Alice the Bure, yeah. Alice the Bure, the drummer. From Mason City, Iowa. Wow. Yeah. She was so badass. So, anyway, uh, the reason why um, we're talking again is uh, your movie, Fanny, The Right to Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, finally, yeah. Yeah, it finally came out because the, the yes. last time uh, we talked, on the podcast, um, it was still in production. Yeah, and by the way, it's it's opening in select theaters in the Philippines, uh, probably Manila, uh, September 7th. What is that? That's Wednesday, this Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. I'm going to get this out. up for the 7th. So, yeah. We can, but I'll, I'll, I'll definitely promote it all over social media if it's. They got to see it, man. And uh, that's the thing. So I did see it in the movie theater the first day it came out. Oh, yeah. Okay. And um, it was shown in this, uh, in um, an independent movie theater. They play independent mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. So it's the usual place where documentaries are released in the, okay. in the, in the, on the big screen. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I, I I I watched it and I was like I uh, I, I got goosebumps, man. Mm. <laughs> it was like because mm. I was is I was seeing this on the big screen, you know. I, mm. And when you watch music documentaries, um, I'm I'm a big fan of music documentaries, and mm. you usually watch it on TV on a TV screen, you know. Yeah. And only the only way to to watch it on a, in a movie theater is it when it first comes out. Before it goes to streaming, they'll put it out in the theater yeah. for two weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. And and but aside from that, if it's an old documentary, then you can only watch it in in on your TV. But then when I saw yours on the big screen, and I and I was like, all four ladies, and then you're rocking out with your guitars, mm -hmm. and I'm like I know that woman, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know, it was very. Well, what, uh, what did you find out about Fanny that you didn't know? Before, before you watched the documentary. Oh my God! So come so on, much. tell me. Yeah, well, well, your original drummer, who, um, uh, and then she, she, she eventually became the lead singer, right? No. 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 She sang, but she wasn't the lead singer. She's got a great voice, but yeah. always we all shared, you know, the. Three, three front persons, including me. Did she, did she, uh, she the lead vocals, you know. She, she sang while drumming too, right? Oh yeah, she 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 uh, sang with uh, Carol King while playing percussion. I mean, she's she's had a lot of gigs. She's a great singer. Yeah, well, yeah. It, the number one thing that really got me was the enormity of you guys. How mm -hmm. much, how much you guys were so big in the scene. Um, because the people who were interviewing, the, who were interviewed, were like you know, were well-known people in the scene. Yeah, and Bonnie Ray, Joe Elliott, Galen. Yeah, Joe Elliott. I'm like, oh my God, Joe Elliott knows. You know, I mean, it it reached so far as as England for 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 a little kid like Joe Elliott, right? Yeah, yeah. a little kid. I mean, oh, he yeah. Def Leppard is from Sheffield. That's a small. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a popular city in England, but that's where yeah. they're from. Uh, it's uh, like a working class uh, town. So yeah, and if so, David Bowie were still alive, I'm sure he would have been. Uh, alive, you know, because oh my he, was, God. he was a genuine fan. In fact, uh, Alice reminded me that he sent us a fan letter with his first album, which I completely ignored. I didn't know who he was, and we all forgot about it. No one saved his fan <laughs> letter. You oh, know, wow. which is too so, bad. <laughs> so, so he was he was starting out as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, you guys. Well, and also, Jean was uh, married sub subsequent to dating David. She married Earl Slick, who is in the film, uh -huh. and uh, he's just an amazing guitar player, you know. So, 
you know, there were a lot of people who knew about us, but people literally, once I left the band, people seemed to think that, I don't know, that maybe I, I, I dropped out because of drugs or whatever, which is absolutely not true. It's just, uh, it just got to be too much for me. But we definitely made our mark uh, in the day, and apparently we're remaking our mark all over again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, when, if the, hopefully, um, people watch it in the Philippines or wherever it's showing there because they'll really feel so much pride the, yeah. that for that mere fact that the first major label uh, all-female rock group was 50% um, Filipino. And that tradition continues today. Like, uh, like the guitarist, like Kirk Hammett of Metallica, he's Filipino. Mm -hmm. he, he totally acknowledges his Filipino, uh, yeah. Filipino ness. You know his Filipino side. And yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. You know, I think Filipinos are some of the best musicians in the world. Yeah, it's like I would type on Facebook like a post. It's like, guys, do you realize that the lead guitarist of the biggest metal band in the world, one of the biggest bands in the world, is a Filipino? I'm talking mm -hmm. about Kirk Hammett and Metallica. And then mm -hmm. people would respond and be like, yeah, you're right. It's like, wow. <laughs> and, and, and now it's the same with you guys after watching that film because, it, I mean, it was just, I, I can still still go back to the time that I found your record in a record store. And you go, these, people, these women look, these, these two women look like Filipinos. What's this? You know, uh, that was the, the, your third record. The one with um, with the cover. You mean Charity Ball? Was that Charity Ball? No, no, no. Fanny Hill. Oh, Fanny Hill. Yes, yes. Yeah, I was from yeah. London. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, yeah. That was the one that I found in a record store, five dollars. And then, like, and then you know, like I said, I, I noticed the, the cover, and it's like these are Filipinas. <laughs> what is this? And what then I, this? I buy it, and then I put it on, and I'm like blown away. Mm -hmm. So from that time I got the record to now, it's just wide open that you guys made a mark. You guys deserve a star on the walk of, in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, in my book. Mm -hmm. I really think that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I really, yeah. I really do think that Fanny on you know like in uh, in in in, uh, in the Walk of Fame, you know, you, you, you really. You really deserve a star there for what you guys accomplished in a very short amount of time. Well, um, but, you know, uh, let's let's acknowledge the fact that Gene and I started our first all-girl band with a with a girl drummer in 19, late 64. So by the time we got down to L.A. in 69, we'd already been at it right. for close to five years. So yeah, it was right. not an overnight thing. We really worked hard uh, all that time. That was the felt. Yes, that's right. And it became Wild Honey, which became Fanny. In fact, it was Wild Honey who uh, played at the Troubadour that famous night when we played Open Hoot Night uh, in 68, fall of 68. We went down to L.A. We played at the Troubadour. And, um, you know, the guy at the club, he said, well, you can only, he didn't really want us to play. You can only play five minutes or whatever it was, 15 minutes. And <laughs> after we finished our however no, many number of songs, um, the audience went absolutely. I mean, when I say they went crazy, they really did. They all jumped up on the tables and they were stamping their feet on the table, uh, tables wow. and just going crazy. And that guy, that same guy, ran up to Jesus, play some more, play some more. And she goes, Well, you, you said only, you know, five minutes, <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you don't want to beg with Jean because, like, you know, she's tall, she's got that big bass, right? right, right. That was a good moment. That, that was a really great moment for us because we looked at each other and we knew that we'd made a statement, right? And, and Nikki wasn't even in the band yet. It was Addie. Her name was back then Addie Clement. Now she's known as Addie Lee. She was a lead guitar player. I didn't even play lead. But we were already so good and so tight and we could do it. I mean, that's the main thing. Nobody... When I say nobody, uh, you know, except for our parents and a few, maybe hundred people who'd seen us play, by that time maybe it was a few thousand because we would play Air Force bases and frat parties mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, 
very few people knew of the existence and, and knew, you know, basically at the time, the only uh, platform you could take was to prove that you could play like guys, unfortunately. So that's what we had to do. Mm -hmm. And we did it. And somehow we got past that limit, you know, and I think that's what people are realizing now. We don't just, we can't, you know, we don't just play like guys, but we express ourselves in a particular way that uh, nobody was doing then or quite frankly have done since. Yeah. And the family so sound is a particular sound. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Oh, that's another thing. <laughs> that Because uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I use weed. I, I'm a cannabis user. So I was so high and the sound system in the theater was so loud. Yeah. And here comes Fanny with uh, your, your, um, your double vocal um, on, or I think, no, the, the triple vocal, even the, 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 your keyboard player was singing on, uh, Oh. We didn't triple our vocals that much, but maybe double vocal. Are you talking about "Ain't That Peculiar" or something else? No, it was something else. It was the heavier ah. song. It was the the song that that's uh huh. Take care of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More story. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That song. Yeah, and so. It's a double vocal, right? The whole song, I think. Uh, well, maybe Gene and uh, and Nikki sang it together live, so that was probably Beat Club, yeah. That yeah. you're talking about. I don't think the record was a double vocal. Yeah. Um, it no, it was the um, it was the live television. It yeah, wasn't the yeah, that was the Beat Club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was there in the in the middle of a theater, and you know, <laughs> powerful vocals were yeah. coming through. I'm like, wow. Oh, yeah. this mm -hmm. is some kind of sound in what, 1971? Yeah. You know? Well, or all of us definitely were playing at our peak uh, yeah. at that point. I mean, my guitar sound is just ferocious. I have to admit it. I mean, I listen oh, to it. That yeah. is ferocious. You know, in the outro, you know, even, even, even I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, for that era, mm. for that year that you were playing that that guitar. You were just as heavy as everybody who was playing. It wasn't. You had that sound. You, yeah. oh man, you had the sound. You had the rock sound. You had that hard rock, nasty. Yeah, and you know, let's face. also acknowledge the fact that I was uh, jamming a lot with players like um, Lowell George of Little Feet or St uh, Steely Dance guitar player. Um, Jeff Baxter, actually, he was in the Doobie Brothers, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, Jesse Ed Davis, for example, Elliot mm -hmm. Randall. Um, and, you know what I tell people now? This is actually true. This is quite true. the The sound that is now identified as classic rock, mm -hmm. we were all making it up then. You know, because yeah. that was the point at which it went beyond the fat and slightly dirty blue sound, the Kinks got into distortion so did the Beatles a little bit but by the time we really matured as Fanny that that sound was totally happening you know uh you have Jeff Beck who we did a few gigs with for example um and that sound just burst out it, it just like happened because I guess it was meant to be at that at that point you know you had like the names I just mentioned yeah. Those were the top notch. Those was a creme de la creme of people, guys, because there weren't any really any other women who were doing it, who were developing that sound that had not only a head and edge, but it had a contour to it. You know? Yeah. It the, had yeah. big the time whole, contour. Big and a lot of people don't realize that that's part of playing that type of sound. You have to have a contour. It can't just be like I'm loud and I'm flinging it out into the universe. Who cares, you know? But if you have contour and you have a good song, boom, you know, like like as you were just singing that lick, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so when when that was happening, when you, like you said, you guys made it up a lot. I mean, you're making up along the way. Mm -hmm. Was it? Uh, did did was everyone was it a matter of getting louder i mean louder or just like you said 
developing that full sound that it's just in, it just envelops. Well, I think there are three factors. You know, one is that you have to have a sense of what it is that you're going after, right? And so when we were going over oh, uh, after sounds, it wasn't just the fact that we were getting louder. Like it was the gear. It was the guitar you were using and matching it with the amp. So there were a lot of uh, amp manufacturers who were trying stuff out. Mostly I used uh, a twin, but I also had a deluxe. I had for... Uh, you know, a while I tried a couple of other amps, but I, I mostly stuck around there. So, and, you know, Lowell was just, he was such a warrior sound. If he found out somebody was making an amp, he would drive out to wherever they were to oh, wow. check yeah. it out. You know, similar to the Beatles, when they learned a B7, the B7 changed the Beatles' trajectory completely. They all got on a bus and went across Liverpool to some guy's house to learn this chord that, was like the you know they'd heard about it was like oh, the B oh right right B7, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. and so you know it wasn't that they played it loud I mean is there anybody going to that's a B seven right there but mm. you know a girl that song would not have been written if they hadn't known that B seven and of course the Beatles got louder too you know Day Tripper and all that but they never got like Jimi Hendrix or Lowell or uh, you know, Elliot Randall, right? Reeling in the years. That's Elliot Randall. So, and when I left Fanny, I actually hung out a lot with him in New York as well, jamming because we all, of course, continued, uh, continued on. But, you know, so it's the amp, it's the gear and the knowing of how, uh, learning how to control the contour, like how loud you are, but it has, a, it has, a definable edge to it in terms of sonics and part of the way that i got into it or fanny got into it was we um were assigned a sound stage at warner brothers movie studios in fact so did uh yeah. little because they were with warner brothers as well and so we had to you know those are large stages with high ceilings right oh, so yeah. you know you didn't just turn up you had to learn how to turn up and contain the sound so that people could understand it. You know? Right. Yeah. And that was a big deal, which was not really spoken about. We just did it. You know, those of us who were warriors of sound or warrior says uh, in my case, <laughs> right? you had to go after it. You had to experiment. You had to fail and, and, and just keep going. You know, how do you get to blind alley? That, that was a, like two years of experimentation, a lot of experimentation. Wow, but then that's how you define a sound, you know? Absolutely, I mean, yeah. I mean, when I was listening to it in the theater, it's like, no one sounds like this. <laughs> no one sounds like this, even now. No one sounds yeah. like this. That's it's right. like It's like aggressive female vocals, and it's not screaming. It's not, mm -hmm. it's just, it's not shouting. Yeah. You know, it's not, it, it's, it's aggressive, but it's like, it's, uh, oh, it's hard to explain. You just have to, you can mm -hmm. just feel the intensity, but it's not how uh, a typical male would say, well, they're just shrieking, you know, they're female <laughs> shrieking. It's well, like, I'll oh. tell you, you know, the fanny attitude was take no prisoners. Although we didn't discuss that among ourselves, we just worked really hard. We played all the time or wrote or rehearsed or, you know, but that take no prisoners attitude is like, we're going to grab you and we're not going to let go. You cannot get away. And so that's what you're describing to me now, because not only can't you get away, you want to go back to it. There's something yeah. very familiar and warm to it, even though it's ferocious, right? Yeah. It's yes. home in yeah. a way. And in, in kind yeah. of a, it's a kind of a weird thing, but it's so true. It just absolutely is true. And people hear that sound and they want to go back. They want to go back. Yeah. Yeah. They want more. Right. Yeah. 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 They want more because <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is aggressive, but it's um, it's like it's not offensive, is what I'm right, saying. Right, right, it's right. That's offensive. a good way to put it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. you know, it's aggressive, but not offensive. So it's like uh, it's like that lyric of Bob Marley. It's like uh, one good thing about music is when it hits you, uh -huh. feel no pain. Yeah. You know. So when you when it's good music, it's not the pain, but you feel the feeling of the people who are singing it. Yeah. And, you know, and then, and Jean, you know, when she. Forget about it. Jean. Oh my God. 
<laughs> it's like when, and then when she's singing, her mm -hmm. eyes, yeah, you can see the fire in her eyes. Yeah. It's like this lasers coming out of her eyes. Yeah, you know, and like wow, these guys are so. These guys that's are. A good way to put it, I'm going to use that. I think that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, and I mean, and that's where the intensity of the singing comes from. It's like the whole thing, her whole being is singing that that uh, that style, you know, and yeah, yeah and meaning every meaning, every syllable, every syllable is meant, every word is meant. It's like. Like you said, it's like it's like you you're grabbing people by the hair, and it's That's like right. well, not, not only did, did we grab you by the hair, we reached into you and pulled you by your heart or your soul, whatever. We yeah. actually took your territory, and you yeah. were happy to give it up. You know, yeah. You know? yeah, we're gonna take you, take no prisoners, right? Boom, you're dead. That was yeah. <laughs> <in a> good <laughs> way. That was the, um, you know, when I started listening to uh, classic rock and mm. starting, and, you know, and when I was starting to fall in love with all these bands from the 70s, you know, I was mm -hmm. like, from my thing, my personal view of the most creative years of rock would be from 67 to 73. That, that span for me yeah. is like when everything was so just, it couldn't get any cooler. It couldn't get any uh, more creative. And so many kinds of music was coming out. You yeah. had the progressive rock guys. You had the hard rock guys. You had the blues guys. You had the... Everyone. All Everybody. right now. Oh, my yeah. God. I know. All right. You know, come on. You know, you know when never going to get any better than that, by the way. No. You, you, you know my band, Wolfgang, when we started out, we would play covers because we would have to play three sets mm -hmm. one hour each so you got to fill that up with so you know content <laughs> yeah with go yeah exactly yeah. with content and well uh, listen when we were when we were learning how to be a band and getting more ferocious and getting yourself together we played oftentimes more than not five sets a night every weekend yeah you know, clubs. Cool. That was what was required of of the bands. And, you know, there were no child labor laws, especially back then. Yeah. <laughs> well, like we're 17, 18, 19, 25 sets a night, you know. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that is some, uh, well, I'll use that word ferocious again. That's some ferocious training because you cannot, you can't just kind of uh, mosey through five sets. You have to keep their attention. No, you cannot. And we did. We did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So imagine this, a band like uh, like my band mm -hmm. at that time, you know, we were starting out um, three sets a night, one hour each, and it's all classic rock. And this is 1993, okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody in the Philippines knows the music that we're playing on the stage because they're a different generation already. Their parents, mm -hmm. it was the music of their parents and their uncles and their aunts, yeah. right? Yeah. So those were the people who were our age or younger than us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we were playing free we were playing mm -hmm. black sabbath we were playing led zeppelin aerosmith we were playing everything and um and it was and classic rock wasn't being played on the radio in the philippines so nobody knew what was they they thought that the, all these songs were our songs you know? mm, wow incredible yeah. incredible yeah. you guys are so good man you have so it's like these are not our songs these are old songs. These are the songs of <laughs> our, our, our titos and our titas, you know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's how that's how my band learned how to write songs. Yeah. From covering yeah. all of these great songs. Absolutely. So, yeah. So our songs, like Wolfgang, the trademark, I would say, from my perspective, would be it's like hard rock bordering on heavy metal because our guitar player Manuel. He was a he was a fan of Randy Rhodes, mm -hmm. so he was that kind of a, a, a guitar player. Mm -hmm. But but my my thing, I was into free, you know. Mm -hmm. I was into uh, uh, Simon Kirk, you know. He's one of my favorite drummers, okay. you know. So he so combine that 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 heavy mid tempo beat, mm -hmm. but with a with a metal Randy Rhodes type of guitarist, you know. So with and we were listening, 
and funny enough, we were all listening at the same time to all of this music from the 70s at the same time. So it affected our music so much, you know. And we were listening to everything that was happening in our present day, uh, present time at the time, which is Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, mm -hmm. Alice in Chains. Fish. So, <laughs> wait, oh, Fish. Oh, my God. I was such a big fish head. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Trey Anastasia is one of my favorite guitarists. Mm. Um, but anyway, I mean, and so what, what I'm saying is that era, it was all that, all the music from that era was like that. It would just capture you and you would just surrender. Yeah. You would just surrender to it. Mm -hmm. And now that I know Fanny exists and I've seen everything, it's like you guys were part of it. Yeah. And, you, and your sound was yeah. just the same. Yeah. It was the same, uh, we got you, but you're going to like what we're going to give you, you know, you know, and you're going to come back for more. And yeah, it's the same from that era. But and you know, we were taken for granted, I feel, or there was a lot of resistance because the critics were pretty not nice to us, you know, and condescending, I would say is, is the big word that comes up for me. So condescending. I mean, a couple of them said nice things, but I would say maybe only 20%, right? I mean, most yeah. of them were, were not nice to us. And uh, so when I hear people say, like you, really mm -hmm. good things, how, you know, you're affected by it, not only is it nice to hear, but it's also a little bit surprising because we got so used to that, you know. Oh, the negative. Uh, yeah, it was like there was a moat that nobody right. could get across, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because I mean, you know, I'm I'm from a different era. From I didn't I wasn't in that era where mm -hmm. when I watch documentaries from that era, yeah, there's a lot of that peace and love and thing, but there was a lot of uh, male chauvinism in that era too. A lot, and, I would say, almost over. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, you. It's hard for people to imagine now just how bad it was back then, but it was overwhelming. You know, that's part of why I left the band because. I was just so broken down. Uh, all we did was work. You know, honestly, we were on every rock show. We were even on the Tonight Show, dude. You know? Uh, and people who, like, eh, who, was the you know. who was the host? I'm sorry, what? Who was the host of the Tonight Show when you played? Well, Spirit? of course it was, uh, you know, that was 1971. So, of course, it was uh, Johnny, Johnny Carson. Wow, nice. 1971, right there, right? That was the, that was in the same month that we played the Fillmore uh, East for what two or three days with Humble Pie and uh, uh, Lee Michaels. Oh my God! Yeah, you didn't know that. <laughs> wait, wait the, the 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 one the record that came out that gig. Uh, the Humble Pie uh, live yeah. record. Was, yeah, without the, we were playing the same nights. Holy shit! You were at that gig. Well, you know, I had, I had never heard of Humble Pie before we played those Fillmore East gigs, and I remember thinking, "Boy, that guy's really good." You know, and at that point, I had already played with a lot of great guitar players, so it wasn't mm. like I was overwhelmed or anything. But I thought, "Yeah, he's he could stand toe to toe, toe to toe with any of the great players I knew." And believe me, you know, so like was Ken Henry, who who sold me my Les Paul. Had been in um, what's that band that? Uh, oh, think of it. Anyway, he was a great player. Could play as, as good as the guy in Humble Pie. But I, I just that noticed was, it. I thought, oh, that guy's really good. <laughs> that was that was Peter Frampton, right? At that yes. Show. Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah, three God. nights on stage with those guys. Oh my God, that's blowing my mind right now. Because you know why. Well, you know, people don't realize how many gigs we did. When I say we worked, I mean, you know, staple singers, Papa John Creech, Dr. John, oh, uh, Stories, uh, you know, both of the Edgar Winter, the Winter Brothers, they had their own things going on. I mean, wow. on and on and on. We played with everybody except maybe the Beatles and the Who. You know, everybody. Okay, right? okay. I, gotta, I, gotta, I, Wolf, I mean, you name it. We, we did gigs with them. Man, okay, here I gotta say this to the 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 people who are listening, the rockers who are listening, especially the the ones of that era. Mm -hmm. So Humble Pie, uh, was it Rockin' the Fillmore? That mm -hmm. classic live album. 
which is considered today to be one of the albums that influenced heavy metal, the, mm -hmm. the genre of heavy metal. So like, like prototype, because they were so, they were heavy and, and they had that heavy slow, like free, like they were heavy free, and like really heavy free. You know, they were really good. Trust me, hearing them live was oh, an experience. Yeah, yeah but that was the same week that we were on the Tonight Show and we flew up to Canada to the Kenny Loggins show. Within a couple of months, we were on the Sonny and Cher show, and right after that, we flew to England and we were recording at Apple with George with Jeff Emmerich. You know, so uh, you know those are all part part of these ever expanding experiences. That those three nights with Humble Pie were great. But they weren't necessarily a standout for me. You know, I thought it was, oh, these guys yeah, yeah, yeah. are good. But right. believe me, we were playing with all the best uh, players. And before we left the band even, you know, I mean, we, we just played with everybody, right? So right. Jeff Beck was probably maybe six months. Well, we, we opened up for Chicago for like a month. Those guys were great, by the way. <laughs> Is anybody, does anybody know what time it is? I mean, amazing. They were really an amazing band. Wow. And you know, they didn't even do their own soundtracks. Uh, I remember, you know, we would work so hard on our soundtracks to try to get everything right, you know. And then I noticed, finally, I noticed, you know, those, this, the Chicago's not coming in for a soundtrack. So I finally asked one of the guys, I go, why don't you, why don't you do, oh, because you know what, it changes anyway when the crowd comes in. So, but they just do a line check for us. And the microphones are all the right, you know, height, et cetera. And actually they're right. I mean, if you have basically your guys know how to set up the sound and they know where the mics need to be and basically what they want to hear in the monitors, you're golden. And yeah. then you have to deal with the fact that it all changed between sound check and the show, which is <laughs> one of the things that plagues you, you know. But yeah. we were so, you know, to tell you the truth, because we were girls, we were nervous. We had to prove Every single time we play that, we can play as good as the guys. And that's exactly what we did, you know. Wow. So it wasn't was, was easy. So that was in your, that was in your mentality. That, Absolutely. That. Well, it wasn't just the mentality. It was the reality. See, that's the thing that's uh, hard for people to understand. That was our reality because people not only expected us to fail, but many guys wanted us to fail. They were so jealous. You know, because in, in a lot of instances, we got better than the guys. Honestly, yeah. you know, yeah. who, made, who, who made up the guitar part for uh, Ain't That the Slide Guitar Part for Ain't That Peculiar? That was only one person, and that was me. Now, of course, I had great mentors, like, you know, like I mentioned, Little George, etc. But, you know, I don't even remember making up that part. That's what's so interesting. I don't remember because we were playing so much and all the time. I'm sure we did the original version because we were a club band. Right, uh -huh. oh, so it was okay. you know we already knew that thing. We knew how to do Marvin Gaye and Tommy Terrell and all that kind of stuff. All that material right. we were doing for years. That was part of what we grew up on, you know. So, you know, like you said earlier, playing the hits of the day was amazing because that was a golden time. It was a diamond time for music. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have Bacharach and David writing. Walk on by, and you have Dionne Warwick singing that. You know, just to learn that song was such a big deal for us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you <laughs> see me walking down the street, you're dead. You're dead. That first line, you're already dead. You hear the, the you know, the emotion in Dion's voice, and you hear that. You hear the chord progression. You're like, what is this? Right. I remember hearing that on the radio, thinking, how did they do that? They do that, you know. So we set out to find out, uh -huh. and we did. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And what? Um, yeah, I wanted. I wanted to know. Could were ah sorry. How about the these bands? These uh, these big bands that you were playing with. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They were. They they were. Uh, they weren't the, the guys that you're talking about who were jealous about from you. I mean, jealous of you, right? These no, the better the bands were, they yeah. were not jealous. They, they were really nice and they would show us stuff. Let me give you an example. This is a, a band who achieved fame from one particular song, you know. Uh, 
Hey now, hey now, what's the matter when you feel, you know, come and get your love. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now that is, I remember being at the Whiskey A Go Go. We were doing one of our, you know, nights there. And um, at least one or two of the guys ran up to the dressing room. Those guys could enter our dressing room at any time. See, we were very exclusive. You couldn't just get into the fanny dressing room, right? But Redbone could. And uh, he ran up to me, the tall guy with the mustache. And I, I forget if he played guitar or bass. Anyway, he, he sits down right beside me and he says, June, we just recorded a hit. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, great, you know. But he was right. They recorded one of the biggest hits of that year, right? And yeah. every time, you know, people don't necessarily remember the name Redbone, but once I start saying, come and yeah. get you love. And they had the stock mix. Do, 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 do. That's a stock link, right? It's, uh, that, right, that, right? But they made good use of it. It's so well-crafted, right? And those guys were always nice to us, right? They never took it for granted because they had to work so hard. Jesse Ed Davis. Yeah. Uh, similarly, he's is uh, Native American, right, from Oklahoma. He used to come over with his wife before he was known. He and I, and she would just hang out. He and I would just jam for hours. This is before uh, Dr. My Eyes. <laughs> You know, that, that is an incredible solo. And by the way, that was not rehearsed. He didn't know he was going to play that solo. In fact, um, Jackson has a story about how he came in and uh, Jackson played in this one tune thinking he might want to play it. Uh, Jesse said, nah, that's not really my style. Play me something else, right? And so yeah. Jackson plays on Doctor My Eyes and he said, yeah, I can play on that. So he says, you know, oh. <laughs> yeah, just, just tune up and play, and they recorded all of it. Part of that solo is in while he was tuning. You know, oh that's God. how much of an intuitive genius Jesse was, right? And he knew he could play that song. He knew he could contribute. Otherwise, he didn't want to do it, right? Uh, he had that Native American aspect where, you know, you're thankful, you give thanks, you're not just killing the deer for the fact of killing it, you know. Right, he right, right. wanted to contribute. That was part of his ethos. I yeah. mean, you know, in his own way, he passed that on to me. I don't want to play just to play loud or just do these buzzkill licks. What for? There are a lot of guys doing that, right? Mm -hmm. I want to make a statement. I want to contribute. I actually like solos that you can sing along with, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, So yeah. that's my thing. It might have to do with the fact that I'm a girl or a woman, right, that I, I want to think about it. I want I, I want to contribute. I don't want to just go play those blues licks with embellishments. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I know what you're saying. In fact, yeah. when we were working with Todd Rondergren, I remember his, you know, he'd make this joke, oh, yeah, that's licks. That's like number 57, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and he was actually right. We were all stealing <laughs> from each other and borrowing from each other, right? Uh, that's just the way music is. But he made a joke of it, and I thought it was I, I thought that was a really good point. Because you want to make the lick your own. You want to place a stock lick in such a way that it's making a statement that actually yeah, yeah, is yeah, part yeah. of the fabric of the song, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, like uh, the the guitar solo in Freebird, mm -hmm. it's all stock licks. Yeah. Right. It's all stock blues licks, but mm -hmm. the way that uh what's his name? Uh Collins, Alan Collins. Mm -hmm. Alan Collins, the way he plays it is just so he yeah. plays it magnificent. That's the that's yeah. that's the I describe that solo. Even though it's you know uh, the Freebird uh, the Freebird the song mm -hmm. is over overplayed whatever yeah. that guitar solo in the end is still magnificent to me. Mm -hmm. That's the word I, I want to describe it. <laughs> but it's basically all these blues licks, no, 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 all these bands yeah. that are. But the way he's playing it is just like wow. You know, there are two songs of which I learned, well, there's really four, but let's just pick these two, in which I learned every single lick. One of them was How Long, How Long Has This Been Going On? Do you remember that yeah. song? Yeah, I love that yeah. song. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the others is uh, Life in the Fast Lane. That is an incredible solo. So, oh, yeah. you know, I, I am, well, another song is, is uh, Cornell Dupre on Rainy Night in Georgia. Do you remember that song? Um, I That's can't. a great hit. And, and Cornell Dupre, uh, his name is not so well known, but his, every guitar player is, you know, he's so many 
of our heroes of that particular time. We played in stuff, for example, New York guy. So I learned every lick in in rainy night in Georgia and they all count, man, because I, they're in my, you know, they're in my repertoire. I can call on them. And more importantly, and this is something that Jesse taught me is the phrasing where you place, where you place them. I mean, Jesse never said a word to me about that. We just played, you know, so that's Mm -hmm. what I picked up and non-verbally just from the beauty of just doing it, you know. I'm it's glad. Fine. Yeah, I'm glad that the the non-haters, the ones who were um, uh, who actually played their instruments. That's why because they were they were secure with themselves that they didn't. You know, they were like, "Oh, hey, yeah, you guys are great too. Let's jam." You know, <laughs> it's the haters that are the ones that can't play as good as you. That's why they're jealous. Yeah, they're the ones who wreck it for everybody else. <laughs> yeah, and then they wreck it for everybody else. But yeah. I mean. Um, like uh, I was gonna say, uh, like you covered badge of cream. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Your guitar solo there, man. It's just like it's well, you know, he, he Eric was the backbone of that solo. I mean, I basically yeah, yeah, yeah. From him as well, you know. And so all those licks, I just made them my own. That's all. And oh, by no. the way, badge, I have to tell you that the reason we did it that that song was written for girls. I mean, we, when we sang, yes, I told you that, you know, that's mm. a particular, um, it's girls saying, you know what, you got to watch out because this is a dangerous world for us. We understood that. It was our song. It wasn't, you know, Eric and George Harris's. That was a, our song. When we sang. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean like the, 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 the lyric, the, what they were singing? It lyrics? was our song. I mean, it's, it's. To us, it was talking about the dangers of being a woman. Oh. Don't walk alone in the park, etc. You know, if you think about it that way, I mean, we understood that. We didn't talk about it. We just could right. feel it when we, because we would try out a lot of songs. But that tune, every single time it sucked us in. And that's why we loved it so much. You know, but the, I have the same feeling about like Nikki's uh, Bitter Wine. That's an incredible song that it comes from a different, different age quite frankly i feel like it comes from you know like the middle ages i can yeah. see the guys and the horses with the uh, you know the <laughs> flags and everything bitter yeah. wine it's, it's an incredible song and i think fanny played it incredibly the way that that we expressed it that was our song i mean most people don't even mention bitter wine when they're talking about fanny but i think it's one of our best recordings you know right yeah yeah and that's the thing you guys have really Great sounding records. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, really great sounding records. Like you crank it up. The the record I have, the Fanny Hill record. Yeah, I'm cranking it and crank. I just keep cranking up the speakers, <laughs> and it's not breaking. It's yeah. just getting. Right. It's just it's just enveloping me more. Yeah, you know. Like, and you know, the Beatles let us write an extra verse to "Hey Bulldog," by the way, which is on that album which we recorded at their studio with their engineer. So, you know, yeah. how many people can say that the Beatles re- let them write another verse? Nobody. Nobody. Wow. There's an extra verse. Yeah. Yeah. This last verse. That's our verse. So how did, how did that happen? Did you ask? Well, them uh, there, you know, we were, we were close friends with, um, uh, he was like the fifth Beatle, uh, their promo guy, uh, Derek Taylor. Mm-hmm. So he was actually our promo man in LA for like a year or two. And of course he was really close to the Beatles. And when we stopped, you know, when we uh, needed to make a change and record somewhere else, we, we finally recorded at Apple. And because, I mean, we never even talked to Lee. Nobody even talked about it. You know, that was not a discussion. It was just understood we could do it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm sure the Beatles knew about us because, you know, we hung out with George and, and Ringo. And then we met, uh, Gene and I met Paul and Linda a week later. And then when uh, John Lennon was doing his album, uh, his final album in New York and Slick was playing on it, John asked to meet me. So, you know, uh, Slick called me up and said, Hey, come on down. Cause John wants to meet you. So yeah, man, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you told me the story the last time. It was like, Oh my God. It's like, John, John Lennon wants to meet you. That's you right. 
Like, that's crazy, man. That's, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you realize how crazy that sentence. Well, it was easy, you know, because I just would hang out with him and we would just chat, you know. And wow. uh, it was terribly easy. It was, you know, more easy than, you know, one would expect of the moment, right? It right. was like totally relaxed and he was very interested in talking to me and I, of course I was interested in talking to him but we didn't make a, a big deal of it you know uh you know you're a beetle and you're june milik and whatever we're just right. hanging out you know and yeah. i remember i don't know if i told you this story but at some point while we were talking uh he like the band was running through um what was uh, uh I'll, I'll think of the song so they were running through one of his tracks we're just chatting with him, so he just puts his finger down on the talk back. He says, I know you can play. Now play the song, you know, the song. He said it like that, you know, that oh. Liverpudlian way. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they weren't playing it. I mean, I noticed it too, but they weren't playing it. Like, so they're just kind of showing off a little bit to each other, right? Almost, uh, how would you say? Not just showing off, but they were proud that they were playing. Wheels go, uh, the wheels go round and round, whatever that song is, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you, and they didn't say anything, they just, you could hear it and the way they played. Now they're playing the song the way he, uh, John Lennon would, would do. And, you know, um, uh, Slick was um, uh, during COVID, when COVID hit in, in uh, 2020, he was, uh, what do you call that? Uh, something in place, you know, <laughs> not stationing in place, but hi not hiding in place. Anyway, he was here with us for about a year because his son Lee, who was Gene's son also, was here, mm -hmm. right? For uh, Actually, he was here for over a year. Anyway, so I got a chance to ask him a lot of questions. For example, I'm just, this is not really related to me, but the fact that I got to ask him, say, you know, you know that lick? I'm losing you, you know, that lick right there. And he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he said, oh, I said, how did you make that up? And I just assumed that that was in the overdub or, you know, he made that up. I said, oh, no, that was in, that was in the arrangement. John came in with, with a tune already with that lick. You know, so you realize, okay, pure genius. You know, it's like he had the lick. He had, it's such an integral part of the of the song, the arrangement, the song writing, you know. I love finding out stuff like that. I, I never get tired of hearing uh, recording stories or songwriting stories because they're so important to me. Music is so important. There's nothing really more important. Oh, yeah. 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 It's important. Mm -hmm. so can you, because um, since you, cause you already... Uh, people now know that you and John were like this, or 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 or, or you know, um, just in that period, you know. Yeah, just in a, it's like. I mean, he was shot a few months later. Let's face oh it. Oh my yeah. gosh! Yeah. Is he? Is he a? Because um, people have this idea of him being a brooding, dark kind of guy. Was he like that, or was he just like? I can tell you for a fact that that point of his life, he was, and I mean these words. I'm choosing these words precisely. He was incandescent with happiness. Wow. I mean, there was a light coming from him. He had reached it. He'd reached his true peak of happiness. And he knew it. He absolutely knew it. You know, that was great to see and to share with him. You know, I didn't yeah. say, oh, God, you're so happy. It just was like, <laughs> it was like that. You yeah, know? Yeah. You incandescent with happiness. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. So the um, this whole and then it was and then uh, what's what's interesting is that when after, when you left the band, they continued on this other trajectory, mm -hmm. yeah, which was very was was just very um, uh, weird to say the least, <laughs> you know. Um, but then. Well, Jean got her hit Butter Boy out of it. You know, she was actually at my house in Woodstock in the middle of winter when she got the phone call. I remember we were, we were sitting at our little kitchen table and she, she gets this phone call from L.A. and Because I was just asking her about where Fanny was at. She said, oh, we finally just 
woke up, you know, uh, for real. And then the phone rings and like, you have a hit. I'm, you know, of course that made her very happy, but we were both really surprised. And she flew back to LA and, you know, called me uh, maybe a week later and asked me to do that last tour with her. And that's how we played in, in, in 75 oh. together on that last tour. Brie was on drums because Alice had quit. And, um, so I was oh, on a guitar. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and I brought uh, a woman from New York with me who played percussion. was a great singer, you know. Uh, and Wendy Haas was in the band, and she, she had been hard to lasso, but she agreed that she would go on that tour. It was You know, that was, a, that was actually a good touring band. So how was, since... Um since the early 70s and then now it's 75 and then you're back in the band mm. has have things changed like the audience the the um the rock and roll uh life i mean because you know by this time jimmy's gone jim morrison's gone janice is mm. gone uh, well the bigger the bigger change was that disco was happening so oh. i was trying to write in that vein as well you know, because you couldn't but, fight disco. You could not fight disco. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was in the inevitable. <laughs> yeah, no, you couldn't fight it. It was so huge. Yeah. And it got bigger and bigger through the 70s until AIDS. Until AIDS hit. Oh, and right. It changed right. everything. AIDS yeah. started to hit in 75, 76, and it hit its apex like in 79 and continued on until the 80s. You know, with Reagan not even mentioning the word AIDS one time. That was a rough patch. But, um, you know, the music changed in that way. Plus, reggae was coming in, right? Mm -hmm. Big time. You're right. So, uh, the combination, and there were a lot of good songs that came out of, you know, Ain't What's No that? Stopping Us Now. I still love that. It's got just a great, you know, it's got the groove. What um, were you, uh, speaking, of, speaking of reggae coming out, um, what were your what were your reactions to that music? Because it you know it was you know interestingly enough it was Nikki who tried to get me to go to see the the Whalers in London when we were in London I I was just kind of too busy writing or practicing or whatever I never did go see them until I was back here I saw them in Boston and also New York but um, it didn't you know it's it's for me it's about the song so when I heard Get Upset and No Woman No Cry was uh -huh. The concrete jungle was huge yeah. for me. So those 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 songs are just so amazing. You couldn't not fall into the reggae thing because yeah, Bob no, Marley and the Royals were so good. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, mm -hmm. for you as a musician, hearing that kind of that that sound, uh, or whenever you heard reggae for the first time, because it's, yeah. in, it's inverted, you know, so it's not it's. Uh, yeah, it's an it wasn't hard for me because I was in New York and I had players explain it to me. So oh. once they broke it down for me, I understood. But when I went back to San Francisco and tried to turn yeah, at the band, I was playing with different band members. Uh, there was a, one woman, a, a bass player by, by the name of Joy Joke. She's incredible. But, you know, she's more like jazz and funk. And uh, I, I tried to turn around the reggae, and she said, I don't like that. It's too simple. You know, but within a couple of months, she'd fallen in love with it, too, because once you get into that hypnotic groove, you can't help but live in it you for the duration play. of the song, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to learn how to play bass, that's the mm -hmm. genre to learn, you know? You know. I'll tell um, you, No Woman, No Cry is one of my favorites, and... Uh, I, you can't even find the actual definitive version of well, No Woman No Cry. Whatever they play uh, on YouTube or whatever, it's like a subsequent version. And, but the original version that I, you know, let's say cut my teeth on was so incredible. It yeah. just really, um, you know, that tune is, means so much to me. Man, the lyrics and the way he sang and the way the oh, band yeah. performed it. It's one yeah. of the all-time greats. You know, uh, to me, it's as good as here, there, and everywhere, for example. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I chose that out of my, just now, my head. But I, I really mean that. It's as great. No. Yeah. No, you're right. No, I mean, uh, I, I always say this, is that because Bob Marley, uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers, if you want, um, mm. they're so iconic. Yeah. They're on, it, it, you know, they're on T-shirts, they're in flags, they're everywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the world knows who Bob Marley is. 
some people tend to forget that he's a really good singer. Yeah. He can really wow. sing. Oh my God. Because yeah. because that's how they started out, the Whalers, when there were just three of them, Bunny Whaler, him, and, and Peter Tosh. They were covering Motown. Oh, absolutely. He, he worked in Detroit at a in, in a automotive line. Did you know that? Oh, right. yeah, 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 yeah. That's oh, right. So, yeah. I mean, he totally had that whole experience. You know, he was so poor growing up. Yeah. Uh, him and his first wife, I read a book that she uh, wrote about him, and they were just, like, crashing in a studio for, like, a year. And, and interestingly, there was a – they heard a cat every now every night howling and hissing uh, behind them. Yeah. And actually, there was no cat. They heard it. So, you know, the voodoo was built into his, his <laughs> whole existence and poverty in his early years. He didn't know his dad was, et cetera. You know, it goes on and on. And then I have this joke to myself, and I, I wrote it down in my, I'm writing my second book now. And I said, oh, you know, yeah, it's like, you know, some guys are sitting in a room and they said, yeah, let's get these scruffy black guys who believe that the, uh, Emperor, Emperor of Ethiopia is, you know, their new god and their new cult, and they're going to make up this music called reggae. And you know, I think we're going to—it's going to sell. Nobody could have predicted that. No, no, you could not. You could not invent this kind of stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. You, and those you guys worked hard too. You know, I mean, I say that because I know how hard Fanny worked, and I know how hard they worked. They rehearsed all the time and wrote all the yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, they were. I mean. That's the thing. Uh, when people first hear reggae, they 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 hear the simplicity of it. It's like, oh, yeah. that's, that's mm -hmm. cool. That's you know, I can move my head to it. Yeah. But then you start listening to what the, they're actually playing. You're like, yeah. reggae drums. The that one the one drop. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. the way yeah. the, the Barrington um, used to play it. It's one of the hardest. Things to play on the drums. Yeah, and you got to be disciplined. That's the other thing. You actually have to be disciplined, and you have to understand how the parts work together. If you yeah. leave that, you're dead. You you yeah. really uh, you can't play reggae if you leave that. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just play whatever you want, you know. <laughs> yeah, because because like you know, reggae is it's like a, it's inverted. Uh, it's an inverted rock beat, right? So right. You, yeah. Your, your thinking has to be inverted too. You well, can't. after a while, you don't even think about it, honestly, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, like like uh, like uh, like Led Zeppelin and their song Jamaica. I mean, uh, that's what mm -hmm. the, the, the lore is, or the myth, or the fact is that John Bonham played the way he played it with that big heavy beat because he couldn't play it, you know, reggae style. He couldn't play mm -hmm. one. Oh, style. okay, okay. He he tried in the studio. He tried to play like that, but, mm -hmm. but they were like, he was like, I'm, you know, no, I can't. It's I feel, you know, it sounds stupid if I played like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, was. even uh, I'll take you there by the staple singers. A drummer had just come back from Jamaica, and mm -hmm. he had realized what the drummers there were doing, mm -hmm. and so that's a sort of a kind of an inverted reggae type beat, you know, and that's. Yeah. Part of what gives it its charm, and they had to cut that twice, by the way. So, what song is it, this? It didn't work the first time. I'll take you there by the Staple Singers. Oh wow! Oh, okay. Right, right. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I'll check that out. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and um, so what's uh. Yeah, I mean, so September 7th is when it's coming out in Manila. Yeah, uh, Selected Theaters, yes. And um, it's on my Facebook page, by the way, if you want to. Yeah, no, I'm going to, I'm going to spread it. Uh, I'm going to spread it. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then you said you're working on a second book. What, What's that about? Uh, you know, it starts in 1975. And for me, why 75 is so important, not only did... Gene and I and Bree and Wendy Haas and Patty Bichette get back from the last Fanny tour and started to work on the next, what we hoped would be an LA All-Stars album. Uh, so we got back from the last Fanny tour. I met Chris Williamson and played with her in the studio. Are you familiar with women's music? You're probably not. 
Yeah, that was a huge. That was a huge movement. Women's music. That's. Oh yeah, you you explained that to me the last time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. there you go. So, rock and roll for me uh, intersected with feminism and women's music and a whole other way of approaching life. So that's where I started. It's nineteen seventy five. It was huge. It was a paradigm shift for me and for a lot of people. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's why I started in 75. And so I'm just going through my life since then, you know, albums that I produced and groups, you know, all these um, uh, different phases that I went through, including meeting John in 80, in 1980. Yeah. You know, just a few months before he died. Wow. Mm-hmm. So how's your, um, your school doing? Yeah. Excellent. We just did a lady in the amp fest. We finally were able to have sessions this summer that were in person. So that's a, you know, we lost a couple of years of having those oh, sessions. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, we we had our camps and they were incredible. I mean, these new crop of girls, I feel like, um, you know, Anne was saying earlier, uh, you know, we lost a couple of years. And actually, I don't know, she feels like we kind of lost a generation but i kind of feel like with what i saw this summer i feel like this crop of girls actually know something that the girls before didn't and maybe that's because they had to Mm -hmm. stay home they had to be vigilant whatever they're in a different space and so that's great to see and it's great to know you know wow Mm -hmm. that's a that's an interesting point Yeah. yeah more vigilant yeah yeah more vigilant they're deeper they're not uh they're not like, you know, they girls don't have this thing competing with each other and have, fighting for the resources, but these girls are more working together. Right. And you don't have this feeling like, I don't really like other girls. You know, they, you don't have that feeling at all. Wow. They're working together and they know it. You, you know, know what? I think, I, I, think, I think what it is is that, well, they did go through a pandemic, yeah. which was, which mm-hmm took a lot of lives so they were witnessing all this right this serious stuff that was happening all over the world not just not that's just here. Right. that's right yeah so i mean like you said they they seem to be deeper because they they experience deep stuff you know yeah, totally i mean oh i can't imagine like uh, uh, a 13 year old going through that and understanding what it is that's going on yeah not like not like when aids was happening when i was in high school i didn't yeah. know what it was that's just a whole other thing yeah. Yeah. So no one explained. Well, also, people had swept AIDS under the carpet as like you know the gay disease. This, no, this yeah. you, couldn't, you couldn't even try to put that moniker on. It. You know, couldn't have that kind of a. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, people. Everyone yeah. knew that everyone was in danger. Boom. That's it. End of beginning and end of story. Actually. Right. You yeah. Know, so. No. Yeah, but what I'm saying is like when 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 I started hearing about it when I was thirteen. Mm-hmm. That project was really out on, in the open, but mm-hmm. but they were still saying that it's a gay it's a gay thing. So that exactly. was right. to me, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. so, but nowadays kids are getting the real deal. You know, they're getting yeah. and like you, said, you can't spin that kind of thing anymore these days. Like if that's oh. happening, people yeah. are gonna know. You know, it's like also uh, the girls do not want to be bullshitted. I'll just tell you that right away. They yeah. don't want to be bullshit. They know when you're trying. Well, I mean, we don't try to bullshit them. That's partly why they love us, but they they know, know and they're not into it. They're not into it. They're not going to believe the whole thing, you know, of uh, you know, you're not in control of your bodies and you can't vote and this and yeah. the other. You're over it already at age fifteen. They're over it. Fourteen. Yeah. <laughs> and then and and they would rather get it straight up. Just give it yeah. to me straight, you yeah. know, right. which is great because then you don't have to beat around the bush. You know? That's right. You don't. Absolutely. Just, yeah. My God, have we been on for an hour and what? 15 minutes is the No, just right. Uh, right. Uh, an hour and five. But anyway, are, um, are you, st- are, and music wise, what are you going to do next? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm turning my book into an audio book. I'm writing book too. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm completely completely busy so what's next you know it's actually just more of the same you know yeah. people are inviting us to to do gigs if we can uh uh fanny is playing in in kansas city but it's a sort of a ad hoc fanny it's me and brie and patty uh, patty um uh, quattro 
So yeah. that portion of the band with one of our girls from camp, Mia Huggins, who's incredible. She's going to play uh, bass. So it'll be the four of us doing the gig. So, you know, I mean, stuff like that. Uh, I'm trying not to travel too much. Yeah, I'm 74 now. You know, I, I don't I really want to. For sure. Yeah, we kind of get invited. Maybe we'll do something in the Philippines next year. Who knows? I mean, you know, with Jean's um, uh, stroke, it's, you know, it's kind of tough to, to yeah. plan fanny gigs. Jean might show up if maybe Lee will play, but he's, yeah. you know, he's 36. He's entering a different phase of his life. He's going to start teaching at UCLA uh, music. So or how to put music together, how to be in a band, and so on. So it's a different phase. Um, for, for me, it's always more of the same. It doesn't change, right? Right. I yeah, just right. don't want to travel a whole lot right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Tita June Millington, thank you very much. <laughs> You're so welcome. You're so welcome. I, nice I, talking I to you. Tita, and please give my regards to um, to uh, Tita Jean. I'll, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll call and you guys. Yeah, yeah and if I could mention, uh, if you want to donate to Gene's fundraiser, it's GoFundMe.com slash Gene dash Millington dash Go. All right. And she always yes. needs our, our support. So I just oh, for sure, for sure. Yes, okay. yes. So Great. if you're listening out there, uh, please help uh, you know, with the GoFundMe of uh, yeah. Gene Millington, the badass basis. I say Gene, yeah, yeah. yeah. We owe so much to her, so yeah. Yeah, yeah Okay. For sure. Well, All thank right. You. Thank All you very right. much. And and September seventh, yeah. the movie's coming out in Manila. Support yes. Fanny. Yes. Rock and roll. Yeah. Pinoy Pride. And uh thank Pinoy you very Pride, much. that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, June. Okay. Um uh really, really uh happy for you and uh more okay. power. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>